And eventually I landed on this being the best place for it visually, frankly, just looked the best. What we're gonna do, we're gonna do this the lazy quick Casey way because I think I'm smart. Oh, sidebar story. Uh, whenever I have a silent but deadly flatulent moment at home and my wife is like, eee. I used to blame it on the dog. We don't have a dog. But the people that lived at our house before did have a dog, which is hilarious because I discovered where the dog chewed on the windowsill. I'm like, honey, if we don't have a farting dog, then where do these teeth marks come from? <laughs> What's up, people? So today I thought we'd be back with my dream Grand Prix car, which is actually a Formula B, but very cool because this little car from 1968, in functionality and its construction, effectively replicates perfectly what Formula One racing was in 1964. And for all those that you like classic movies, or you boomers out there, the movie Grand Prix with James Garner is really an epic uh, two-part movie on Formula One racing in the mid-1960s. And it's, it's a lot of fun to watch and it actually has a plot line with people. Do you believe that in a racing movie? So, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe your significant other will even watch it with you. But, so we learned a couple of things when I got this. The first big problem is I don't fit in it. Now, that's gonna be a video to come, not today, but I am gonna have to cut the tubes out by the dashboard, reconfigure the dash, reconfigure those tubes, move the pedals forward, and I think I'm gonna just barely fit. But I've been cleaning up a few things and I kind of just wanted to share that experience with you. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push this out if it wasn't in gear. Gear. Is it in gear now? Gear. Okay, here we go. Oh, I'm crashing. God, I'm bad at stuff. Okay. But what you guys will notice, um, I had a little fun. It was just kind of a fun little cathartic thing for me to do. But I took the bodywork off and the gentleman who had this, this is like 1981 Ford Fiesta Red or something like that, whatever. It looks pretty good. So it was sprayed with automotive paint and then it had rattle can clear coat, which I think was dupla color, but not before a satin white and another rattle can was painted as the stripe. And it looked okay, but I really had kind of a dream of painting it lotus gold leaf colors or something different, but I don't have a lot of time. And I like red and white anyway, so I thought, how can I make this look better? And uh, what we're gonna do today is, I put some decals on this side, but I wanna do that with you and show you the process on this side where it's still bare. But I took the body off and I took 1500 grit wet dry sandpaper, wet it down with just a little soap so it has some lubricant, and I wet sanded out the orange peely in the dry of the clear coat. Then went through just a quick few process of polishing. I've got a random orbital polisher here and went with some fine cut cleaner. Um, didn't have to go through a giant stage. Is this fine cut or medium? I think I use medium cut cleaner and then straight up went to either swirl remover or fine cut cleaner. Uh, oh, also word of the wise, all those people that are saying, we're gonna do paint correction. That's just a fancy word so they can charge more for wet sanding and buffing of car. That's what it really is. But anyway, so got it looking shinier and I like that. The other thing I did, if you wanna come over here and take a peek, it was just all red. So I painted the inside of these reverse NACA ducks, uh, satin black, I think looks nice. And also down here at the nose, this is kind of a weird one because it's got this here. This was all white and white in here. And it, it sort of looked less like a race car and more like Arnie Tolman. I don't mean that mean, but it, there was a striking resemblance. So I decided I would make it look more like a race car and to do so I masked it off. I painted the inside satin black and then this here too. Looks a little bit more the classic style of what the Grand Prix cars were. This of course is Lotus 49 bodywork and for all you Rush fans, um, the James Hunt character drove a green one in the beginning when he was first starting his rivalry with, with uh, Nikki Lauda. So I put a quarter inch gold pinstriping here just on the edge, looks nice. Went with just a standard red three in the front. I didn't want to do a big number spot up here because it's sort of elegant, looks pretty. And the other thing I did was, you'll notice that the car has aluminum panels here on the side, the right and left, and also this panel here, this was aluminum and this was bare aluminum. So to get the look right, and maybe you'll want to kind of come back to the side here, Gavin, this probably coming back here will give you the best the best view. So a couple of things here, guys. The aluminum panels on the side of this car are not original Lotus 49. They were basically fabricated. They go down a little further and they don't curve in, which is period. So, it, so it's, a little, it's a little large. The other thing is the line continuation doesn't go perfectly to where this was brushed aluminum. 
and the nose kind of looked thin and weird. So believe it or not, I uh, could have mixed the same color, but I found a rattle can uh, acrylic enamel paint at a hardware store that was a really close match. So I cleaned up the aluminum, shot it with some self-etching primer and painted it. And then I took these panels off and I wet sanded them. And basically that process is you take your aluminum, you take it outside, you got a bucket of water and you got a couple of nasty Scotch-Brite pads and you just go to town. Um, I didn't really want to go crazy polishing it because with the exception of like Roger Penske, freaking chrome or nickel plating or his, all his suspension arms forever. Usually the people that polish their aluminum monocoques in racing aren't that fast because they just want to polish it. So there's something to be said for just letting it be utilitarian and clean. So I brushed it and then did some basic decals to be period for the time. So let's do the process of putting on some decals. I want to show you what I know. Now these, typically I'll go to a, a sign printing guy and have things made on vinyl. But in this circumstance, uh, I was kind of lazy because I don't have a lot of time anymore. And I thought, what, what can I do? So I like the number three, it's prime, it's round, it looks good, whatever. So I called up Pegasus, well I didn't call them up, I ordered online, but Pegasus uh, Racing, I think they're in Wisconsin or something. You can get different roundels in vinyl of different sizes and you just order your numbers and your names and stuff. And then I went on eBay and found some period correct Firestone and Shell stickers from the 60s. I kind of liked them, got in the size I want, got those coming. And I had some general vinyl rolls, uh, so I wanted this, and I thought it looked better in um, gloss for a background for my name. And typically you'll see like in the late 60s for Formula One racing, they'd have a white square here where the name would show up. It was like Jimmy Clark or Hill or whatever, racing it. Uh, another thing I did was to get this perfectly straight, I didn't use scissors or a razor blade or a ruler. I want to do something faster. But I do have a very nice, good metal shear here that's not all dented up. So I was actually able to just put the vinyl in the metal shear and slice it nice and dead straight. So that I don't know if I was more impressed that I was able to not get it in a crooked or that my metal shear cuts that well. But um, yeah, so here's what we're going to do. Now, here's the tips I got for you guys. Your number spot's a really important thing. And Gavin, if you go back there and look at the side, I'll talk about that. So. The placement of this, you got to think what it's going to look like when it's driving. So obviously the driver's head is going to be here, you know, maybe it's a white helmet. And if you put it in the back, it's, it's going to weight it different visually. I think like a, you know, a, a fine artist, it's the visual aspect. How balances your painting? Well, same thing for a race car. And that's why I chose to paint the underside red in the front. Kind of fills it in better. And because these side panels go down real far, I left them in aluminum because in terms of its visual weight, it looks lighter. So um, I could have gotten a, a bit bigger number spot, but it was just too big. It takes away from the look of the car. So I put masking tape on something. So you can decide, do you want it up high like this? You know, do you want to lower it? Do you want to put it way up here? And you can play around. And eventually I landed on this being the best place for it visually, frankly, just looked the best. So got the same thing going on here. And if you come around to the other side, we're going to do this side. But now that the first side is done, that makes my job a lot easier because the car is symmetrical from one side to the other. So you'll need to pay attention to that because if yours wasn't symmetrical, it might be a problem. Come on over here first. The other thing is if you have your random orbital like this, you're buffing, you really want something to clean if you're gonna set it on the ground. Otherwise you can get all kinds of little gritty particles in it. And that's all you need is one little piece of grit that just looks like a spirograph and trashes your car. So we got the number here. So here's how I'm going to get it to be exactly even because obviously it's a circle. So it doesn't matter which way it goes like this. I'm going to pick the point, one point in space, how high, how far back and forth. And to do so, I'm going to cheat because I'm lazy and smart. All right. I'm just going to use this to measure with. This is my exacto knife. And uh, I am looking here and I see that in terms of being forwards and backwards, this is where that number spot is, the placement is. And it is exactly halfway between this hole and this hole. Let's see if those holes are lining up. Man, these holes are dumb. It doesn't look like it's lining up right, because I'd say go here. Okay, so it's not exactly straight. So we're gonna go with right here. And I'm gonna grab a little piece of masking tape, if I can. 
Should have, I should have thought this through better, duh. Okay, so here's my mark. I'm gonna go up slightly. I'm gonna use the point of that for where I want it to do. So that gives me forwards and back. Now, I just need to go up and down. So if you wanna look at the other side real quick, uh, two things I've done here. It appears, the spacing to that and the spacing to that. So the three is pretty well centered and the nook of the three is just a little high. The, I think the bottom is slightly bigger around than the top, so it ends up being like that. So it's not perfectly centered on the crack. But what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna measure down from this place to where the top of the number needs to be, just like that. So I got my, got the exacto like this, got my fingers in one place, all I have to do is hold it. So I'm gonna put my fingers right here, and then that right there is exactly at the top of where the number needs to be. So, oh, didn't stick. Casey, you're dumb. This is anticlimactic and stupid, stupid artist. Okay, there you go. So the other thing I'll make note of is, um, I'm not replicating any paint scheme of the time. I've got period correct numbers and colors that reflect well to the mid 60s, you know, lotus gold leaf colors, but I'm not doing a gold leaf car. And I thought about doing something like that, but I think there's still a lot to be said in racing in general and vintage racing is we all have our heroes and our dreams and things that we like to see that are iconic. Um, and that's okay. But I think there's a lot to be said for building something that's of the period correct spirit and tasteful and nicely executed. But I think it's also okay for us to be ourselves because with a vintage car like this, the history continues. It's not in the past. It's still going. So I, of course, like the style of the time and I admire that. I think they're good looking cars, but I thought it would be more fun just to do my own paint scheme just because of what I think looks good and I like the colors. So that's what we're doing here today. Now remember, it doesn't matter how this goes because it's a circle. So all I have to do is get this point right. And if I look from this, I'm actually gonna come about a quarter inch back from that. Okay. When you pull this off, you wanna be careful. Now, I, I do notice a couple of things with this. It's a little wrinkly, so we're gonna to have to be extra careful. And this is also the cheaper vinyl that does not have the air release channels in it. The really good vinyl nowadays has like a little grid pattern, so the air, if there's a bubble in the middle, you can just push on it and it, the air escapes through it. Rather than the old days when you had to use like a gentle soapy solution of water and a squeegee, I freaking hate that. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do this the lazy quick Casey way because I think I'm smart. So I lined it down to get a point and I'm literally just gonna come across like this and where I'm pushing is creating a line, a line of where it's adhered. And you notice how I'm holding this upward. Reason being is I wanna come at it and work as well as I can this way and down so that no air gets in it. The other thing you have to be mindful of is this does curve a little bit like this. So I am gonna to have to inherently pay attention that there will be some stretch. There's also a negative space right here, so I gotta hold that farther away so it doesn't hit that point. Okay, so it's in the negative space, everything's fine. And it's coming across really well. Okay. Now, if you do get some weirdities, some like gentle wrinkles, you just can't get out and things in it, um, don't freak out. In the sun, some of that stuff has a tendency to go away if you rub it. But if you're doing the old vinyl, it doesn't have air release channels. You really gotta be mindful with it. Sometimes it's nice to have a helper, but the helper needs to make sure they're keep not letting it wrinkle. They need to hold it taut, but not like pulling against it. And they need to hold it at the angle that works while somebody else squeegees it down. So for me, I don't have that luxury right now, but I do have the luxury of my helper being so kind as holding the camera. Thank you, Gavin. And so that you guys get to see. Looks like there's a little bubble there. Now this bubble, I'm, I think that bubble is probably between the masking paper here and the actual vinyl because I did a good job of pushing it down, but we're gonna, we're gonna see about that when we get to that point. Now, now that we're getting to the end of the fiberglass and getting to where this panel is, it's, um, it's a little frustrating because the, <coughs> and that's okay because it's a race car, but this panel is about an eighth inch um, inset from it, it's not perfectly flush. So that's something I'm gonna to have to pay a little bit of attention to. So what I'm doing is I'm already starting to wrap this around the edge just gently with my thumb. And then when I get to that point, we'll slice the vinyl with a razor blade and then we'll wrap what's left over the edge. It'll look really nice. But 
that's why you kind of you got to be paying attention exactly attention to what you're doing and by that I mean putting down the vinyl this way and uh, but thinking ahead uh, because it's going down really well and I don't want to have to pull it up this this old style vinyl doesn't pull up very well but it was very convenient see I got a little wrinkle there so I'm going slow it was very convenient and it's nice that Pegasus you can just order roundels and some things and I don't have to monkey about with going all custom now it's being a little bit of a jerk we're getting a little bit of a, a wrinklage going on so I'm probably gonna have to do a little slicing there's a little extra material here that might have slightly stretched from when I tried to pull it up. So what I got to do is do the best thing I can, kind of go at an angle here to work out that extra material. Because you can, like when you're coach building a car and stretching and shrinking metal, the vinyl works in much the same way. So if you're, you're patient, it'll work. But it, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I don't do it a lot, but enough to have been pissed off plenty of times in the past and struggled with the old vinyls and stuff. So that's about as well as that went. No, I didn't want to do it with the water and everything like that. Went really well on the other side, but I don't think this vinyl was done real well with the masking paper. So we're going to see how good it is, how good a job. So far, pretty darn good up here. Not really any bubbles or anything. And since I had just polished the car, it was super clean. So that's excellent. Also, if you'll notice, I'm pulling this at a low incidence angle. I'm not pulling it out because I don't want to accidentally pull it off. So here's that. So here's where we got some inconsistencies that are annoying. Let's see. Will any of them go away? Not really because that air is trapped. So I'm going to grab the X-Acto knife that I don't remember where the heck I put it. Where did I put it, Gavin? What? Okay, cool. Yes, I'll shank a bee. Okay. So, as annoying as it is, you're going to end up having to slice it so the air can come out. But you want to be careful. You want something really sharp. You kind of go around it to work it out. If you do this, it'll also sort of do it on its own. But you really want it to happen when you first put it together. Um, otherwise, you may never get it to come out, really. But, yeah, it's kind of the way it is. And then I'll show you the trick with the three. And yeah, that one's an annoying one right here. I can work this a little bit more later, but you guys will figure it out, the technique that works for you. Because a lot of things, they can't be learned just by telling it. You're going to have to do it. You're going to have to feel it. But think ahead. And I will say, if you can, make sure when you do this stuff, it's worth the money to get the modern air release stuff. Because... None of these wrinkles or bubbles would have happened if I had the air release material. But again, for the sake of convenience, cost, and time, um, I just went ahead and got this. And it's perfectly good. It's going to look great. And especially when it's out in the sun a few times in racing, I think it'll really come along. But if you go back and look, um, go back farther, you can see how I chose to put the number spot there because in terms of the visual weighting of the number spot, it looks most balanced and I think it's going to look nice. Um, and maybe I'm overemphasizing the car looking nice as a feng shui visual art piece, but screw you. I like my race cars looking good. Okay. All right. Again, when you peel this off, you, um, if I just start going like this, the vinyl is sticking to the backing. So I got to get this backing on here a little better and I got to start a little nicer. So what you might have to do is kind of peel this like this. So it'll, it'll pop loose. Oh, and then you got to be careful here because that three is going to come loose. So you really don't want to just go ripping this off willy nilly. You got to be mindful because you need your vinyl to stay stuck to the masking part here. Okay, I could make it an E. No, like a three. That's damn. Now here where it pulled off, you can see it's a little wrinkly looking because I was being willy nilly showing you guys that. So I'm going to really carefully, and I also wash my hands before I did this because if your hands are dirty, you'll have little bits of dirt and rocks and stuff stuck to them, and then that will get stuck to your vinyl and create little bumps, which is really annoying. 
Okay, that fixed that, that should work out. So here we go. This is pretty simple. I'm just gonna get down here, gonna aim it. I wanna get the center part right there centered. And I also want it to be, okay, so that's about the right height there. I don't wanna end up twisting it. I don't want it to be accidentally italicized or something. So there it is, it's just starting to touch. I'm gonna go right here at a high point and I'm gonna go right here. Okay, so that's a line of where it's touching. I'm gonna hold the bottom out, I'm gonna wait on that, okay? And what I'm gonna do is, I'm not gonna push down the whole thing because it's not all vinyl. Only the black part is what counts. So I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna work this out. Notice I'm going from the inside out because what I'm trying to do is get those little wrinkles that started to form to go away. So I don't care if the masking gets wrinkled, but I do care if the vinyl underneath is wrinkled or going wrong. Okay, so it looks like that's gone well, all right? What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go right here and I'm gonna just do this last piece here. Okay, the three is stuck. Now, we're gonna start working just the three. Now, if you overdo this, it can, uh, it can be a problem. The other thing that can be done, if need be, now in this circumstance, I don't think I need to, but if you start getting wrinkles in your paper, you can simply slice the masking paper if you need to relieve some tension of it, okay? And go all the way out, because it only matters that the three, the black gets down right. But in this circumstance, we don't need to do it yet. So I'm just gonna keep working this. Hope I know what I'm doing. If the car curves in different directions, it may make it so you have to do that. But right now, as long as it's not getting super wrinkly, I can just follow the three down. I'm getting excited, so I need to calm down, take my time. Okay, now here you'll notice I'm pushing this down, but this is starting to want to touch. So this is actually an example where it would be helpful if the masking was cut. See how I released this? Great, so it released it out here, and then I can keep pushing just down the three where I need to. And I'm not doing this with any extra water, and it's going pretty well, just being a little patient, taking my time. Okay, so it's down. And we're gonna see, I'm gonna hold this at a low incidence angle so it'll come off. If I pull it out this way, it'll likely, it could likely pull up the vinyl. So I'm gonna go down like this. All right, and you're gonna to wanna to watch those corners. That's where it's easy to pull it up. But you can see that other than where some of these bubbles were before underneath it, we, it, it laid down really, really nicely. Got a little something here. I just give it a tiny pokeage, okay. Yeah, these are some of the ones from before. All right, not too, too bad. A little sun will help it out. Looks like there was one little rock or something in there. I can feel a piece of grit, which drives me bonkers, but not much I can do about it now. Okay, so that's basically it, guys. That's putting the vinyl on. Of course, the, a big number is the hardest thing to do. And let's see, it looks like it goes shell and then firestone. So, looks like about a finger off the bottom, about, oh, I don't know, from the edge of the, this, about four fingers from the leading edge of this to this point, and about one finger up. So we'll come on over here, and we'll go ahead and put this on. This one should be really easy. I'm gonna make sure my hands are not dusty and there's nothing on the car. So what did I say? It was three, what did I say, four fingers from the edge to this, Gavin? Like that? Four, yeah. All right, so right about there and about one finger, which is right about there. Okay, so. Now I know you can't see both of the sides of the car at once, but you might as well try to get it close. Oh my gosh, I can't get the backing off. Duh. Sound like a stupid ghost. Duh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sidebar story. Uh, whenever I have a silent but deadly flatulent moment at home and my wife is like, eee. I used to blame it on the dog. We don't have a dog. But the people that lived at our house before did have a dog, which is hilarious because I've discovered where the dog chewed on the windowsill. I'm like, honey, if we don't have a farting dog, then where do these teeth marks come from? But when that doesn't work, I remind her that we live close to a historical place of which there were probably both white men and Indians dying. So I say, that we live on an Indian burial ground, and that is a ghost of a flatulent Native American, which is not a slam. I'm pretty sure everybody farts. Okay, back to the decal.
Yes, not bad. Looks like it's about a half a degree counterclockwise. I must do better. Okay, I'm not gonna look at the other side. We're just gonna place this however it looks the best. Also, you gotta be careful how you pull that off because those little flag sticks stuck and I about ripped one off. Okay, here we go. That looks pretty good. Yes, yes, yes. Super easy. The small ones are easy, they're fun too. Okay, so then for our last bit, we got this, which is uh, where my name goes. It's uh, about an inch away from the back, a little bit above that, so that should be easy. I'm just gonna come over here. This one will be easy. I know where it needs to go, right about there. And I'm just gonna do the best job I can to keep it horizontal. And we'll slap that dopey name on it and it'll look all cool. So when we come back, guys, I'll have to get a little more in depth. We'll take the body off and we're gonna have to start cutting some tubes and making it so I can fit. And then once I can fit the cockpit or the tube frame of the chassis with the pedals moved forward, then I know I can add, re, you know, put the tubes back in. So then we're gonna get back to cutting and welding and figuring out how to do the gauge placement. All right, that looks pretty good. This one might be a little trickier. Come from the end. And I am holding this up. You notice it's kind of floppy like that. I don't want it to touch over here because if you touch here and there, it's likely you have too much material and then it'll end up wrinkling. So you really want to go from one side to let it come down like that. All right, and there's that. Push down a little bit here and a little here. There was a little bit of a dent in it from the, uh, the uh, sheet metal shear. Stay there, Gavin. All right. Oh, look, this is, it's not your car, then why does it have your name on it? All right. Now these, the little letters, you wanna be careful pulling this off because if you get one that sticks with it, you'll go ripping this off real quick and then you got a letter over there and then it's kind of hard to place it back in line because the computer cut this out and it has them set perfect. So it's a word of the wise. Now back in the day, sign painters would have done this and uh, I got a lot of respect for the guys that still do the art of sign painting with brushes. And sometimes with cars, I do like to do that, but you know, it requires a lot of time. You gotta carefully pencil out your layout and then hand brush it. And it's a lot of fun. I have a feeling that the Indy Roadster that Mike Meyer and I are doing, we potentially will um, do hand painted decals and graphics and words and stuff on it. So, but anyway, guys, I just thought I'd bring you along, have a little fun with you, uh, putting the rest of the decals on and showing you how I did it. But here's this side now matching the other, and I think it looks pretty darn good. So now that it's all cutie pied up, I think it's time for us to make me fit. And assuming I can fit, and it's gonna be a cool car, then it'll be time to start going over everything, getting on the setup pad, doing nut and bolt check, all this, the suspension alignment and such, and some corner weighting. But before you go, I'll show you a couple of parts I got, which I'm pretty excited about. Now you'll notice that this, these were the mirrors that came on this car. Now these are a modern mirror. You see these on IndyCar and Formula One in the 80s and 90s and all. And they were here, and I think they look stupid because these are not from the right decade. So the two most classic mirrors in the 60s are Radots and Talbots, and I always forget which one's which. But my favorite are these that have the spun aluminum and the rivets and held on like this. Also typical of something you see on a Cobra, but very much more period correct. Those are gonna look fantastic. You can still see out of them really well. It's got a nice round uh, piece here, and let's face it, formula cars are so draggy, it really doesn't matter that much if uh, the mirror has a little bit more drag, let's be honest. Um, and in vintage racing, mostly everybody cheats. Yes, vintage racing, especially in all the groups that are nothing but American pushrod V8s, everybody's cheating. So, let's see here. So I guess where I was going with that, I'm not cheating because I can't afford to cheat or build a psycho motor. I don't really care. It's just nice to be period correct. And I bought this because it was something of a romantic dream of mine. I enjoy this time period of racing and the style with the bias ply tires and all. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. But the other thing you'll notice is, have a look here. This is the steering wheel that's on it. And the quick release has got lots of play. And that's just, that'll just take away the enjoyment. It's not a bad steering wheel, but the quick release is garbage. So. I got a much better quick release, which I hope I can find. Hey Gavin, you have any idea what the heck I did with my quick release? Uh, I haven't seen it. Darn. 
There's a gasket. Huh. Well, anyway, I've got a quick release that has basically no play in it. It was a little more money, but, um, and I found this steering wheel on eBay. It's a Motolita, which is period correct for the time period and the right size. It is round, um, but that's okay. I'm still gonna have to make myself fit. I'll have a little bit better visibility uh, when I move the gauges, but this is exactly period correct. And I got a much better quick release so that, um, you know, when I'm driving this, let's say I'm at Watkins Glen, going down to the toe of the boot and then coming back to that tight left hand, uh, you know, or um, at uh, Pittsburgh, at Shenley Park, you, you wanna have perfect precise feeling in your fingertips so you can dance that thing. Uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun. So guys, subscribe if you like and come back. We're gonna do more cool racing stuff in cars and I think I'm gonna go home. See you guys next time.